Greetings, I am Tom Murrow. I know you could be anywhere, so the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, and means the world to me. I want to welcome you to 2022. If you're listening to this right at the beginning of the year or sometime in the future, I hope you know that you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. I have been deeply reflecting upon how do I want to start this year? How do I want to start off the Celebration Podcast in the year 2022? And this is what I decided. Let me take you back. A few years ago, in the last few months leading up to my daughter's birth, I began a project. Now, I had a few intentions with this project. For one, I wanted her to have a set of recordings that could serve as a time capsule of what life was like just as she was arriving. And for her to begin life already surrounded by a community of people who were invested in her. Now, in the end, what I did is I ended up interviewing over 20 people for this project. And I began these recordings in the late summer of 2019. Now, imagine where you were in the summer of 2019. Like all of us, little did we know what was awaiting us just around the corner. So what I have done lately, as my daughter's been growing up, is I've started re-listening to these recordings, and I have found such deep meaning in them. I mean, at the time, we, we didn't know her gender before she was born. We didn't know her name. We didn't know a lot of things. And so the conversations I was having with people were, as someone who I hadn't been a parent yet... I didn't know what I know about her now, even in the short time we've been together. And so it was really just having a conversation with people on what do we want this person we know that is about to arrive on earth to know? And it was such an interesting thing to think of. I want you to think through it yourself. What would be things you'd want someone to know who was about to arrive on this earth just a few weeks from now? And those were the kind of conversations that we were having. Now, as I've been re-listening to these, they have just been bringing so much meaning and value and joy to me, and I want to share them with you as well. So what I have decided to do is we are going to start the 2022 season of the Celebration Podcast by sharing with you new edited versions of these interviews. The original title of this series, when I first released them when she was first born, I released one a week for about eight to 10 weeks. What we're doing now is we are re-editing these, putting them together in a different way, and this series is entitled Gifts for You. Altogether, this series is gonna span 13 episodes in total. So it's gonna run from the start of now to 13 weeks from now. And each week, I'm gonna invite you into a conversation that's very special conversation that I'm having with people, and really asking them questions about what would you like someone to know who's about to arrive here. And what you're going to find is what I also discovered is that the advice that they're giving to a newborn is advice and insights that you and I, no matter our age, also need to hear right now. So I have a feeling when you listen to these episodes coming up that you're going to find something special that you connect with in each and every single one of these. So what I'm going to do here is get out of the way here in a second. This week's episode, we are going to start off. It's a very special one. It's between myself and my wife, Adora. And it is a conversation we recorded literally one day before my daughter arrived. And now that we know the time of day she arrived, I can tell you that it was less than about 15 hours before she came onto this earth. So very, very special recordings to me. I am so excited for you to hear it. At one point, we are talking in a car, so the audio is still, you can still hear us great, but you're going to hear some background noise, but honestly, it's just worth it to just hear the kind of things we were talking about and our fertility journey and everything that went into this beautiful arrival of our wonderful daughter. So after this, this is what I'm going to encourage everyone to listen to in this series is this first introduction that you're hearing now because all the introductions moving forward 
are going to be right to the point. I'm just going to introduce the the episode and get right out of the way. So, my friends, I appreciate getting to have this conversation with you. I hope you enjoy these next 13 episodes in this series, Gifts for You. Let me get out of the way, and here we go. Hey, just before we jump in, just wanted to share a quick explanation or disclaimer. The recordings or the interviews of the content of this was recorded before February. So in this instance, the one you're about to listen to was recorded in February 2020. And some of these were recorded actually in around November, December 2019. I share that because with so much current events going on, with so much happening, it seems on an everyday basis, if you're wondering for some reason if something seems out of context or, hey, why aren't you mentioning this? Or, ooh, that comment you just made, given what just happened yesterday, I'm surprised. Just just giving that context that I recorded these ahead of time so that I wouldn't be recording episodes while Jayanma was here with us so I could spend my full time with her. So just wanted to share that ahead of time so you know the context we were in, the time we were in, and the commentary we gave. Enjoy. Well, hello there, my love. Hello, my love. <laughs> Why don't you share a little bit where we are, what we're doing? So we are in Delray, and yesterday we got to this lovely boutique hotel in place um, to both celebrate my birthday, 42, and also have a lovely kind of mini, mini, mini baby moon, a night away from home mm-hmm. where we can just focus on each other and our adventure that's coming up mm. and just have some space and be near nature because we're in this lovely um, reserve where it's a wildlife reserve for wetlands and um, birds and it's only about half an hour from home but it feels like we're in a completely mm-hmm. different place altogether. Lots of fresh air, it's bright sunny, you can see the marina not too far away. And the room was gorgeous, the service was lovely, and we felt very pampered and just in our own little space and bubble. Great. <clears throat> so do you want to, you mind sharing at all what you're reflecting upon or what you're thinking? Um, in terms of reflecting, just being excited, um, but excited in a very low-key way. Um, thinking about this journey of how this is the beginning of something and the beginning of something that is hard to even begin to fathom. Um, but it's the first step of adding someone to our family and it will be part of our little unit. This will be the most significant part of our union ever and something that will just change and expand our lives in so many ways that we can't even begin to fathom right now um, and super curious about the journey um, it's probably one of those things it's like driving maybe but you can't understand how you're going to do it because it just seems like so much so many things to keep in mind at any given time but that what's the person is actually here they've shown themselves they've become who they are they're becoming who they are you take one day at a time one step at a time and you make it work the best of your ability so yeah it will feel um overwhelming as a concept but once the child arrives it will feel i think like something that you just approach on a day-to-day natural basis. The next thing you know, you look up and it's been 20 years and you can't even remember how it was before. <laughs> like the card from last night, 30 years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how as much as I know tomorrow is the day of significance, how it you really have to like pause to reflect on that. Otherwise, it just feels like another day with things to do, appointments to go to, people to pick up. Um, I'm ready for the conversation starter. So uh, how do you feel to be over? (laughs) I'm so bored with that question. (laughs) I always tell people I'm excited. 
and I feel like people are underwhelmed. They're like nervous. Oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I think people are hoping for that. <laughs> and I'm like, and they're like, are you nervous? So I was like, no. <laughs> <sighs> Once my thing was just, I just want baby to be here. Yeah. After that, then it's I suppose the nervousness of every parent. Yeah. But. I'm glad we got the house set up. So true. For, for me, tomorrow is about meeting baby and making sure baby's healthy. As long as baby's healthy, when we meet baby, um, I feel as if everything else we can take in our stride. And we'll be able to meet um, each joy, triumph, challenge, bit of excitement, careful with grace. But we just pray for this healthy, well, health all around for all of us. Um, I come through the delivery well, and the baby comes through the delivery bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you said that very well. I am, yeah, I think just being being present through it all. While we were setting all this up, it's like, ah, oh, sick as said, uh, it's not how I envisioned, uh. <laughs> but how I know I'm going to look back in a you know, a couple of years, many years, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna have that same anxiousness that I had when setting this first up. So, you know, I think that's with a lot of things that you, you look back on it and, and yeah. think, be present. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just being present now so that everything doesn't become just a checklist. Mm -hmm. Got to get this ready. Got to get that ready. Okay, baby's here, so we got to do this. We got to do that to make sure through each of the special moments that I'm actually in that moment, not thinking of what needs to happen next or what I could have done more to prepare, just being right there, experiencing it live. That is very true. Um, as inconvenient as this has been. And for people listening, what is this? This is me slipping and falling at a Joshua tree about three weeks ago um, and then getting surgery the week after. So I'm on the mending end of it, thank goodness, just in time to hold baby. Um, it has really just slowed me down and made me not take each movement for granted. And just it has forced me to really examine how I do every single thing, which has helped really just bring me into the moment and think about just the little things like the fundamentals of just holding baby, which wasn't something that I had to think about at all. And so if you're at the granular level of holding, it just makes everything else um, more present and more, everything's just more, more of a thoughtful experience, how best to go about it. So it's been a, a, the most surprising blessing. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I have tons of questions. Should we ask them here in the car? We should ask them here and then see where we go. Okay. So we will, we're doing this one a little out of order than we normally do, but I want you to introduce yourself to baby and share with baby the meaning or the story of your name. That's what everybody's doing. Oh, okay. She's like, why are you asking me this? I already met baby. So basically when we do these interviews, mm -hmm. I'm saying everybody, okay, talk to baby as if they are in the room mm -hmm. and then introduce yourself to baby and then share the story of your name. Absolutely. Okay. Hello, baby. Kedo. Okay. So yeah, baby and I, as baby's already used to hearing, is mainly going to be Igbo, Igbo language and occasionally um, other languages, maybe English, maybe French. Um, and the story of my name, I think it's appropriate that I started in Igbo because Adora is such a typical Igbo name. If baby is a girl um, or gender assigned female, a baby is automatically an Ada, like myself. The first born daughter of any family is an Ada. And they don't have to be named explicitly Ada, but that's their position in society and the position in the household. 
and it comes with lots of responsibility but also a few perks um so that would be if baby is female um and that's ada the ada part of the adora and then aura means or oha uh, means the community or the people or everyone um it's like the Igbo say ohaneze oraneze Eze is the people who lead and um, Oha or Ora are the people that are being led in the community that are being looked after or get a say in who is their Eze. So as the Ada of the Ora, you have your responsibility to look after the people and your community and make sure that they are well represented. And that's the story of my name, Adora. Hmm like Auntie Adeza. Yes, Auntie Adeza, who is um, Ada and Eze. So the first daughter of the Eze. And so her responsibility would be more uh, to the Eze in some ways, or as princess, first daughter of the prince. (laughs) That's awesome. What about the other, what does it mean to you to be, your your now middle name, but what did it mean to you to be a Wandu growing up? Um, it's so interesting. I think being a Wandu primarily for me was about the fact that our family is so big. Because the family is so big, um, I was always surrounded by family and just always had a very clear point of reference. Even though I was growing up abroad, um, I saw a lot of my mum's family, the Mbonos, and I saw quite a, a good number of my dad's family, the Wandus. But I, I never felt a sense of being displaced because I always felt that I had roots somewhere. And then, of course, whenever we were back in Nigeria, especially once we grew up and we were back, we moved back to Nigeria in my when I was about 10, 11, 11. Um, yeah, 11. And through my teenage years, it really became a very significant part because the Wandus have been living in Enugu for decades and we're very well established there. And so I couldn't really go out into town without running into someone I was related to, which gives you a sense of not just security, but also a sense of responsibility, knowing that you will be seen, you will be reported upon, but very much a sense of indulgence as well, because I always felt like family members I saw were on my side and we were always on each other's side. So it was more being protected and looked after rather than spied upon. Mm. What would you like baby to know about being proud of being Nigerian? I know they're going to have a lifetime of that being instilled in them, but what would you like them to know right from the gate? I think um, there's so many great things about being Nigerian. Um, I think the first thing is the strength in numbers. I think there's a reason that we have thrived population-wise, not just geographically, because we have so much gorgeous geography all over the country, um, spanning from the rainforest region where we're from to more the Sahel desert region up north with the River Rhine and other pockets of everything. So geographically, of course, we have lots of oceans uh, bordering the country. Um, but as a people, our resilience, our sense of opportunity, our willingness to look for that opportunity, a, a sense in, in, in the society that you are expected to do well and you should be expected to always be looking for a way to step up, especially Iwa society, um, how excellence is is just seen as a standard, um, but that there's also just this huge sense of humor about who we are and what the world, the way the world sees us as well as, um, especially in Iboland, almost a sense of almost um, superiority <laughs> and entitlement and, a, and just being expected to be better and how you, you take that for granted that you are better than than that and so as a as a result you should be showing that you are better than all these other things um, and i think that gives you something really important to strive strive for to maybe always try and be your best self be it in your external experience uh, ex- external 
expression of yourself or or just in the way you share yourself with the world? Hmm. How do you think we're doing on time? Yeah, I think this is a good place to stop. A good place to stop? Yeah. We'll come back in. So we're going to be in the car. So if we can finagle having video in the car or otherwise we'll just have audio from here on out. But we wanted you to get to see us. So, you know, one of my hopes is that this is an introduction, but also a time capsule. So you can look back many years from now. Right now we're reflecting upon uh, 30 years from now. That's what we were reflecting upon last night in the hotel room, 30 years from now. So maybe 30 years from now, we'll definitely watch this. But this is something you can look upon and see. I mean, look at Adora, she's glowing, smoking hot. Look at that, you're just looking so good. <laughs> supermodel um <clears throat> let me see if i can concentrate after that <laughs> so something you know you can look back upon and see your parents mindset what we were thinking about and you know if ever you find yourself lost you can also use this as a a road map some things to reflect upon that your parents were hoping to reflect upon as you were coming into this world so we'll be back but we wanted to just Get this started with you seeing us. Let me go show you this video. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, so this is where we stayed last night. But we were on the top floor. We got the free upgrade right up there. All right, we'll see you shortly. Part two. Yeah, had to get the action sequence. Hopefully the sound quality is halfway decent. We are heading to our last OB appointment. All right, so we're gonna ask each other questions on this one. Do you wanna start it off or do you want me to start it off? I would like to ask you. All right. How in All right. this... <laughs> Initially, when you thought about having children, maybe before we met, okay. what you thought your life would need to be like before that happened, and how that concept has evolved since we started this journey of actually having a child. Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to even remember now, to be honest. But I had imagined that, first of all, when I got married, that I would be established in my career. So, you know, whatever leadership development, that whole business development, that whole area would be a, a solid foundation where I was able to then launch my music career, was ready touring, all these kind of things. Best friends with Janelle Monet, like all that vision I have was already established and then I got married and then from there um, like I I never was like like you where like yes I really want to have kids it wasn't this this uh, vision board of my life didn't include that I had a feeling that once I get married, I, I guess I trusted that once once you get married and you're you're with the person that you want to spend your life with, that I have a feeling that I will be very inspired to want to start a family with this person. So, but but yeah, I think maybe and it might be like a male thing, maybe that you want to like ah uh, be financially secure and have this area of your life covered in terms of your business and all those kind of things. That was probably a big part of it. And I, I think uh, a large part of my relationship with us together and listening to personal development stuff was finding balance in that socialized as a man to find your uh, sense of purpose and fulfillment and your contribution and all that through your professional life. And so, especially around... I'd say 2016 into 2017, finding that balance of expressing and finding fulfillment in my personal life too. Did that answer the question? It's meandering. It, it answered the first part of the question okay. really well. And now 
the second part, I don't know if you fully explained what you conceive of where you, you want to be more yourself now to have kids, which I think is where you are now. Can you ask again? I was looking at what our next sex is. For sure. Um, so you answered the first part of a question, which was um, what you used to think. Okay. And now um, you, I would love to know what you think is needed to be in place to have a child as opposed to... For me or for anybody? For you. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I found from your encouragement of actually engaging with babies and children uh, that I'm actually good with kids. And I would assume that a lot of that comes from my youth development background of especially there was a like a two year stretch where me and Sarah with an H were thrown into a room of about a hundred students that were from sixth to eighth grade. So like that terrorist year. And uh and we're told basically like and all we had was chairs. We put them in a circle and it was like, get these kids to not bully. And that was it. Bye. And we would have them for the entire day. And sometimes at lunch, we'd be huddled on the ground trying to eat and figure out what to do next. And there would literally be children jumping over it like that. Like, you know where it's like like the cartoon stereotype where it's like a tornado of kids? Like that. They were literally jumping off the walls. And so I think learning how to communicate something so serious like bullying, discrimination, racism, homophobia to these young people with that energy. I think a lot of that has to do with why I'm able to... But anyways, I think finding confidence in that. Then my other big thing is that I think that what you, what you can do the most is become the best self-aware version of yourself. What are the, what are your knee-jerk reactions where you're not your best self? What are the things that, where you, like one thing I think that I'm going to need to do is, you know, I have a tendency to really push myself far before I stop to eat or rest or relax. And when I do that, if it's, if I know, hey, I can go until, let's say, I don't know, 6 a.m., until 8.30 p.m. But at 8.30 p.m., I need to sit down and eat and relax for about an hour and then maybe go to bed. If I don't do that at 8.30, the further I go past 8.30, the more grumpy and short I'm going to be. I was reflecting last night because I kind of hit that wall that it's it's likely that I might have that plan in my head, but baby might not. <laughs> and so you or baby or Nenma or somebody might need me to at 8 30 instead of eat and do this whole thing step up and so i think one thing that i need to make sure that i'm doing is taking more times throughout the day i can't push myself that far absolutely i so agree was, was this uh that, stop talking no that was oh. a i couldn't agree more okay. i think that's such a great revelation okay i want you to remember that <laughs> um, I'm you. so you have a sense memory to attach to that thought so it stays with you and it doesn't just flee. <laughs> I'm remembering our interview we did at the start of 2019 where you gently touched my leg to... Yeah. Okay, well, the, no. the audience has got enough of this answer, Tom. So I think little things like that, like, you know, so often as, as parents, I'm already including myself in that, <laughs> we, we don't realize, and I, there are things that I'm not even going to realize that I'm going to subconsciously pass one one of uh i think it was kikanza in one of the interviews was saying you know j just remind your kids that that hey this is just one of those things you're gonna have to work on in therapy that i didn't realize i was doing so there are going to be elements of that but i think the more of that stuff you can own and work through the better place you can be set up for you know there's a lot of logistical things that i was learning about towards the end with sleep and all these things that are you know have nothing to do with psychology it's more of the physiology of a baby um yeah i i've been trying to as much as i can oh look a little packers bumper sticker <laughs> as much as i can how can i be as there for our child as we can around 
aspects of their identity that might be a challenge living in a white supremacist America. Yeah. So, I've been working on that kind of stuff too. I'm, I'm ready. I, you Go are ahead. so ready. And I also think there's such a huge difference between your answer of everything you thought you had to have in place before oh, yeah. versus what you feel you have to have in place now. Before it was about circumstances. And now it's really about you as a person. I think yeah. that makes the biggest difference. But on that note, um, my next question is... Oh, I just got to add. I mean, I have been working my ass off in my agency. So, <laughs> I mean, I have a big driver of pushing a little bit harder in the professional life is for still sure. wanting that for baby and wanting that for you yeah. uh, and that's finding a house so that other aspect is there but I guess you're right that really when it comes down to baby you can be rich you can have not as much money right now but if you're an, if you're an asshole in both circumstances baby's gonna be just as screwed yep. whereas if you're an amazing parent in both circumstances baby's gonna have a, a, a great chance so that's a great point my love I appreciate you marrying that back to me okay question number two let's do it <laughs> um, things that what are some aspects that you you had in your life growing up that you want to make sure you replicate and some things that happened while you were growing up that you want to make sure that you will try and avoid as best you can uh, and this is not a criticism of our parents um, circumstances for them sometimes meant that this was the situation they found themselves in. Of course, they did the best that they could. But um, for you, things that you remember from your childhood that you thought were not ideal, thinking back now, and things that you think, even at the time, that you may have not really liked, but you really think were awesome for you. I like that. And I apologize for people watching the video right now with the, you're getting car sick. Let's put on some video stabilizations if we can. I love that question. Uh, a cabin. So I guess what does the cabin symbolize? I think one place where you can get away as a family that's detached, like how we just went, even if this was just down the road, where it really felt like we were out of LA. I mean, I, I barely looked at my phone. I really felt detached from circumstances so maybe that's something up in Joshua Tree or somewhere where everybody's able to just get away from the, the hustle and bustle and really be there with the our, with, within ourselves with each other um, we're gonna be growing up in a city for for the foreseeable future so I really want to make sure that my kids aren't afraid of bugs or getting out there in, in nature and messing around and you mean the same way you don't like sleeping in tents and that kind of no, thing? No, no, a cabin, not a tent. <laughs> yeah, when you go to sleep, we can go inside and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, going out there and exploring nature and, you know, actually seeing the stars, all those kind of things. I want to make sure that our kids still have that. But that, that family time, that place to go. Um, I, let, let's see. So my mom, you know, we'd always have uh, dinner together throughout the week. All of us would sit down. Even both my parents were work their, their butts off. But they'd both find time to, to be together. And um, my mom would always have us say three good things that happened that day. So those, those growth mindset habits. I like that. Um, I, I never knew what the word entrepreneur was. Really? Until I started listening to Gary Vee. I mean, I heard it before, but that was really like, ah, entrepreneur. And I think for a lot of people of this time, entrepreneur is becoming a sexy thing. But my dad was an entrepreneur, and I really didn't know. Like, I didn't put together, oh, he owns his own business. So at the same time, it was, it was construction. So I appreciated how I had to do construction work when I was younger. And that really gave me an appreciation for work. But not only that, my dad's big thing was always have a sense of pride in what you do. Whatever it was. If I, so I'd ask, hey, is this good enough? And it'd be, is it something you're proud of? And so that lesson carries through where there's some task that's stupid that I'll have to do. And I could just half-ass it and no one would notice. But I, I knew that I should have a sense of pride in it. And then the other end is the not the other end, but, you know, that my mom was doing service work. She's a social worker. So, 
our, our kids having a, I want to make sure our kids have a, a calling to serve something greater than themselves. Especially through volunteerism. Did you do much of being a volunteer growing up? Probably. Doesn't stick out too much though. Nah, mostly I did hockey. <laughs> we would volunteer now and again, but... Um, I mean, then the other thing was my grandma. I, I really like, I, I hope our kids get to have the multi-generational family in the house. So I hope that either, you know, my, my mom or your mom ends up living with us or spending a significant amount of time of the year with us or uh, maybe us at, at grandma's house in Nigeria. But I, I really thought that was, that was immensely valuable, having that intergenerational aspect of, of love and kindness what are the things that I don't want um, let me see here hmm. it's hard to say what you what you don't want because it all shapes who you are I think that I think it's important for us to to be mindful of how we engage in disagreements. Um, I don't know. I don't Expand know. on that. I don't. I don't know how to talk about because you're then you're almost talking about your parents' business. You know what I mean? I don't think I'm comfortable with that. Let's their business, just in terms of how do you feel we should. Um, present to the kids on matters that we agree on and disagree on? I think it's important to share with them that it's healthy for mom and dad to disagree. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so us disagreeing, even sometimes if we get a little heated, mm -hmm. that in and of itself isn't negative. Conflict yeah. is a good thing because it's, it's usually, you know, all these things I preach, how you work through conflict really determines if conflict is good or bad. Conflict itself is neutral. So, you know, making it so that they're not like afraid or tense or scared that mom and dad are in a disagreement, getting them to know that there's this trust that they, they will work it out. And so I think communicating that early, um, I, I think it's gonna be really helpful for our, our kids to grow up seeing us kissing and me talking about how you're smoking hot and embarrassing them and me wanting to go like above and beyond and rope them into doing these crazy happy birthday things and Mother's Day and you know I think that'll be good for them to see to just be disgusted with how much I love you until they get older and they appreciate it but just like ah <laughs> I'm looking forward to normalizing that um, I mean my my childhood wasn't very international but, but that's just because it just wasn't. So I like how our kids aren't going to think Africa and picture like a conglomeration of random prints from a bunch of different countries or, you know, they won't just say Africa. They will say North Africa. They will get it like specific. It won't, they won't just think Africa. So, you know, that's great. Um... I like how they're gonna grow up with this huge family from through your family. And that that's a new thing. And and your family works works through their, their stuff. So, you know, there was always a little bit of drama here or there with extended family growing up. So I like how they're gonna they're gonna have that that solid cousinship and, and things like that. I think it's important that we try as much as we can to be in the car with our kids. So I'm gonna, as much as I'm going to wanna get them the Uber Unlimited or whatever, driving them as much as we can or doing puzzles, things where we're able to hear their thoughts in a way where you don't have to look at each other. You know, I think there's a way you can process. That's an interesting thing that you picked up, um, being together and being able to talk and not necessarily just be face to face have a, something that's distracting you that gives you less intensity and perhaps yeah. makes you talk more. Yeah, you get a little self-conscious in your talks. Mm. When, whether it's puzzles or going for walks are good or in a car and just sitting at a table. So, son, I found this. <laughs> I 
like it. And what's this? This is a... I was trying to think of an artist that I think is garbage. <laughs> Football DVDs. So Sarah asked me, what's one thing that you wouldn't want your kids to do or you would be like, oh my God, I can't believe my kids. I do not want our kids to play football. Yeah, uh, we agree. <laughs> so I guess that would be, I want to play football. I would be like, no! So, any other, almost any other, or boxing. Yeah. I'd be I on the fence about wrestling. Agree. Agree. So, oh yeah, and no motorcycles. Yeah. Otherwise, and everything else is kind of do your thing. But it's also important that we perhaps don't play this part of the recording to our child until the thirties, because if they know that these are the things from uh, an uh, early uh, age. Uh. They will gravitate towards them. <laughs> that was a, my dad was very open about. Uh, I could do almost anything, but riding a motorcycle is one of them I could never do. And then he'd back it up with all the people that he was friends with who either were killed or mm -hmm. lost a limb. So we'll just. I think there's. I think I don't think everything has to become a. I'm gonna do what you say I shouldn't do, especially when there's so much openness. But I get what you mean. They could. There is that element of. The taboo yeah. is especially sweet. <laughs> I wasn't born, I, I, I don't think I was very much one of those people who really just wanted to do my thing because my parents didn't. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and I would assess each thing on its own merits according to my understanding and then do them accordingly. Uh, and perhaps I should have taken more more of a cue from what my parents thought I shouldn't be doing but I always <laughs> kind of came down to is this crazy or is this super irresponsible if I don't think it is then I will probably go ahead yeah as much as I was a rebel I wasn't consciously saying let me rebel against mm. what my parents don't want mm. especially since my parents were both so open mm. so I, I was I was the same for me yeah what other questions do you have for me I'm enjoying talking about myself no I got one for you so you are great I one thing I admire about you is you have friends that span years and you're also able to be friends with what people might associate with difficult uh, eccentric people and it's one thing I really admire that I'll, there's people I'll get to be in relationship with through you that I would uh, I would uh, initially think there's no way I would ever want to hang out with this person again if I just met them first then I got to know them I got to see what you see in them so talk about that it's a beautiful quality that you have um I think a lot of it is it stems from the way I grew up I grew up in a big household where you just were expected um, to have lots of people around all the time and so in our house in Nigeria and our house in Engu even when we moved to the UK they were like a four or five bedroom house and so we always had lots of people coming in and out and I, I would make sure I had my own space so that gave me peace and kind of an ability to appreciate everything I wasn't I didn't feel stressed about it because I didn't feel like I, I was cornered into any any sort of space and I think once you start with that security of knowing that this is your home and you have a place in it it's very easy to welcome lots of people into your space and as a result I think I just grew up with all kinds of people because if you, you have relatives coming in and out they're not all going to be easy they're not all going to be nice but you approach them from a neutral standpoint where you're also perhaps someone who's not got a lot of power in their eyes so they have no reason to try and oppress you or sometimes they will so you end up being treated relatively well by them despite the fact that they may be having arguments and fights with everybody else I think because I started off like that I, I've always felt able to approach all kinds of people in a way that 
there is something of interest and value in our interaction and then it allows me to see if this is something that I can build a relationship on um, and even if it is something that isn't necessarily them bringing their best selves all the time when they do bring their best selves I, I love it, I appreciate it and I try and hold on to it mm. and that I think helps me keep with the relationship and um, always reach out and see if I can find that aspect of them mm. however there is a part of me that um, I the exact opposite that I, I am always working on which is sometimes the last thing you did in our relationship is the thing that will overwhelm my overall impression of our relationship mm. so if it's something extremely negative I may find myself completely forgetting all the great things that we did to build this whereas I want to always keep a whole picture of our relationship and not just um, completely judge it by the last thing that said, I don't necessarily give up on the relationship because of that last bad thing, but it does cloud my judgment. I think it does weigh too heavily, so I think I could do better with my relationships if I was able to keep that holistic view. But yeah, I, I think people are... I think most people have a really great side, and if you can stay connected to that really great side, it doesn't make it hard to be in a relationship. Mm. I, I haven't seen that in you. Maybe, maybe I think that's normal if uh, somebody does something and you're upset by it, but I haven't seen you ghost somebody or not give someone a chance to talk about it or work through it. So I, th I think that uh, I, th I think that you're you're doing great at that. If that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It does make sense. This means I hide it well. <laughs> you you have always not maybe not always but you have had a passion for wanting a baby much longer than I have and the I'm sure the older you got the more either you worried about it or people reminded you or people told you it couldn't be done all of these kind of things so I guess it's a two for question if you could share what was what was the inspiration? How did you know you always wanted to have a child and having the patience to to wait? And you even knew you wanted to do it by yourself a little bit. Just kind of that whole that whole ball of energy, if you could talk yeah. about. Yeah, I think it's also another aspect of my childhood, growing up surrounded by family mm -hmm. and knowing I wanted to continue that tradition. Um, my dad is one of twenty two. My mum was one of six. And just having them and their siblings, it, the way they interact and the, the bonds between them was always something that when it came down to things I wanted in my life, I could see looking back on it at the very end of life and wondering, did I hit these, these um, landmarks? I knew having children would be one of the ones that would be essential mm. as part of my vision for what makes for a great life. When, when was that? How old were you when you started to believe that? Um, I think just growing up. And mm. I also think part of what helped was being, especially when we were living in the UK, um, most of my dad's siblings, uh, my mum's siblings, especially the female ones and sisters-in-law and friends, um, they would come and camp out at our house just before they had their babies. Mm. So um, I'd see them pregnant and then I'd see them come home with their kids and I'd be number one babysitter because I was just kind of around <laughs> and relatively patient. And so I just grew up with all my cousins just being born in our house and staying there for the first few months of life. I think because my mum used to be a midwife and then went on to be a healthcare visitor. Plus we were offering free accommodation in a very easy accessible part of London it just made it really convenient so just seeing all these children come into the world and the way they're welcomed and nurtured and it, it never felt like a big overwhelming mm. thing for me and I know people talk about lack of sleep but when you're five or six or seven I don't know if you're really noticing that you're waking up and the baby's crying then the baby's not crying and whatever I do remember changing lots of diapers, but never really being bothered by that. Um, so it never felt like a big thing to bring them into the world. 
and it always felt like a super rewarding thing to have them in the world as they grow up and as relatives as your family so I think that was part of it and then I think by the time I got to 27 28 um, it really became a strong biological urge I, I don't know how to explain it but it was really um, just this this very very mm. physical desire um, and that lasted I think into my early 30s and then after that it just went back to my values of what made a big and important and useful life was to have this family that you brought into the world and you created and you perhaps together made the world a better place just even through adding more love to the world or just adding more um more safe spaces to the world for each other i didn't know that that there that it, around your end of your 20s early 30s that became that it was very it was in fact i remember it was me and my friend serena and we we're both working for hackney council i think at the time we were about the same age i think we we're about a month apart um and at the time she was engaged um to get married and she'd grown up in Italy and then been living in New York and doing all sorts of things around the world but we were just so similar in our our physical need for it it was so interesting we talk about it how we are these modern women who are out in the world she'd been consulting for the UN she'd done all sorts of things with her life but biologically um, as we're turning 30 this drive was just banging on us um, and because she was engaged she did get to have her children soon after but it was always something that we we just talked about how it, this this clock thing is is so real and it wasn't even a, a ticking clock saying you're running out of time it was just more this strong hormonal broodiness that was just lingering um, for I, I would say at least for me three or four year period for her maybe after she had her first but she had two daughters in relatively quick succession and it may have passed after that but yeah it was interesting and so then you wanted to have the baby on your own you're gonna have the baby on your own uh, I always knew that if um, I never had that same landmark thing that other people probably have about marriage how you have to be married you have to be in a relationship to make a good life because I always knew that about how I, that I wanted that for I wanted children I felt that way about children I knew marriage was either or um, so that's why I was thinking well if I can't if I'm not going to be able to set up a situation that's ideal for bringing in children which is having a second person who's there permanently to, to assist and be as in, invested in the child's or the children's um, upbringing, then I will make the most of having this wonderful large family and just as much as it's me on my own, it's not really, I, I have family who will do their best to support, um, but yeah, um, a lot of it would fall on me, but I was quite willing to go for it because it was one of those things I, I felt made a life whereas whether or not you did it with someone else wasn't necessarily the priority. And now we're in front of grandma's favorite place <laughs> the Beverly Center and so that's when we met and then we made the decision to have a child together instead. Um, that was a long time after we yeah. <laughs> the decision was made. I think that was the thing that was most pivotal in our relationship um i always from day one it was a conversation i had with you that this was happening with or without you um and when i got to the point where i also knew that 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 aspect was going to happen with or without you but now the place we were in our relationship I needed to define where I was moving mm. in the relationship. It was getting to a point where it, it needed to move in one direction or the other. And if we were going to move forward, then it would mean you being on that journey with me with kids. And if we weren't going to move forward, 
then I would be free and clear to start afresh and either have kids on my own or find someone who wants to have kids with me. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, in our episode we did on our, our marriage, mm -hmm. folks can refer back to that one. Um, so then we decide to have kids and you get pregnant. Do you want to share any thoughts on what it's been like leading up to tomorrow where you're going to have the baby? I think it's been just this lack of belief that this thing that I've wanted for so long is actually going to happen. And initially it manifested itself in just not bringing hopes up too high. And as we've come closer to the date, I've allowed myself, and I think both of us have allowed ourselves to believe that this thing is, is going to happen, this thing that's just been almost mythical, and yeah, a miracle. Um, years of wanting it, it's, I think it's also how they say with childbirth, you forget how hard it was. Um, it's felt relatively easy. Mm. And yeah, I've, I've been um, nauseous the entire time. I've been super gassy, physically uncomfortable just in terms of my digestive system. But generally speaking, um, once we went down the journey with IVF, all of that has been relatively straightforward. We did lose one of the twins early, and I think that was the biggest blow on this journey. But even that had a sense of, well, what's meant to be will be. And this is the shape our journey is supposed to be now. And so I think that really helped us move past that um, and just be blessed time and time again as we proceed. So, yeah, there's just been a sense of we are very blessed and also a sense of how did we get this lucky? Yes. And that said, we are at Dr. Walden's. So maybe we'll to be continued? Perhaps, or this might be a great place to end. We shall see. Either way, we are so excited to meet you. We'll do we'll do a 10 second final conclusion. Sure. Alright, last LB visit before you come tomorrow. We're back! Yes we are! So we just got done with the last <clears throat> OB appointment. We did, yes. <laughs> you, baby, were looking straight at us there, so it was very exciting to look at your little face. Um, I don't think we'll be looking at your little face again until we see it in the flesh. Yep. So that was really, really fun. Um, and you usually turn away from the ultrasound. Yes, but this time you were just dead on. <laughs> so I think you know, I keep, I keep telling you all week, you're coming out, don't get surprised. Yeah. So I think you're, uh, it's resonating, sinking in. What was that look? No, it was just a look of, you speak the truth. And it was resonating, and I think, yeah, all this activity is hopefully a sign to you that things are, are moving. Moving. Oh, we got the house all ready to go. The last thing that we were really wanting to come in just came in, so I'll put that all together when we get home. Mm -hmm. Assemble that. We're going to pick up your grandma. What does grandma go by? Nana. By Nana. From Enugu to, where did she drive to before she flew? She drove to Awara and then she took a plane from Awara to Lagos. And then she took a plane from Lagos to London and another one from London to LA, which she had just landed. So she's been traveling since Sunday. Wow. Yeah, Sunday morning to get here Tuesday just to be around and help with you when you're here. That's how loved you are. I almost went to St. Matthews. <laughs> oh yeah. And my and your your grandpa, my dad's here. His was a much easier journey. <laughs> he went from Waterford to Milwaukee. Milwaukee to Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> so him and Nana and and Jenny and Uncle Kyle, they will be in the waiting room. Uncle Kyle? 
maybe Uncle Kyle. <laughs> so we can cheer out when we announce your arrival. Woohoo! <laughs> so I guess we're in the, the shade. In the shadow! Shallows! Oh yeah. I always change the lyrics to yeah. fit me. You'll learn this about your dad <laughs> soon enough. Well, any other questions that you're curious about? You can ask them in person when you're old enough to ask these things and we'll answer them as best we can. I'm trying to think if I have any other questions for you. Oh, me? No. Yeah. Nothing more to ask, I don't think. Just ready for your year of adventure and this adventure to unfold. So here's what I've been asking everybody. So everybody gets their own little questions. Uh, but the sign-off questions are... Um, Here's some of the theme questions. One is, um, what would you like a baby to know who's being born in 2020? And then if I'm, as I'm asking these, if any of them come up that you want to talk, to respond to. A decent amount of people I asked, how do we, if baby ever doubts that their blackness is beautiful and wonderful and all these amazing things, what would you share with them? I've asked... And then one of the questions I ask is, what can baby turn to you for, to people? And then I always conclude with, what's your invitation to baby? My invitation to our child is to know that lots of things will happen with us, but at the foundation of all of them is love. And hopefully they'll always feel that love the same way I've always felt it with my parents, where regardless of what's happening, I haven't really doubted it. I have been angry, I've been disappointed, I've been overjoyed, I've been weirded out, lots of feelings, but under it, I've never doubted that foundation of love. And that's my invitation to you. Um, in terms of what can you always turn to me for, I hope, a safe space mm. um, I will do my best to always be able to create that um, and one where the love is unconditional it doesn't mean that there won't be expectations and there won't be this there won't be that but again that foundation of love will never be doubted so that hopefully will create that safety net that you need when you want to take risks in your life and when you even when we go through challenging times um, in terms of blackness being beautiful, hopefully I will do my best to model that and all the fabulous Nigerians around us, as well as all the fabulous black people around us, will continue to be a, a daily inspiration, as well as those in the media, and hopefully just a being from the family you're from, where we promote and encourage and love blackness, will make it very straightforward. And what was the very first question you asked me again? What would you like a baby to know? In 2020? Who's, yeah, I was being born in 2020. Um, I think every year that a baby is born, it, we're living in interesting times that are always changing. But this happens to be an election year, which may or may not change things depending on the outcome of the elections. But it could also be a really interesting time for things to shift. But we're living in a time when everything is in flux and um, the things that we know and believe right now may not be the same in a decade or 20 or 30, 50 years and the rate of progress of change is just sped up but you are coming into a family Oops! What were you saying? But it kept everything we did up till then Yeah Yeah, and that you're living in a time of great change and you're coming into a family that is aware of the change and is moving with the times and will try and stay as updated as um, we we are able but we also know that it's very much the generation that's coming in the kids that were born in 2020 that will be the ones that are holding our hands and pulling us forward into this change as well and as much as we will be our, I'll do our best to be your guide we um, know that very much it's the kids now that will become our guides in the years to come well said, my love. Well said. For me, I was very blessed 
to be one of, I think, the few people, I'm going to be honest, not the few as in like five, but the few as in percentage, whose college degree did more than just give them a skill or book knowledge that it gave me, it, it transformed me as a person and gave me all those other things. And one of the classes that I took was uh, a rites of passage class. So we were learning on, about how rites of passage are important in childhood development. And it was experiential in that we went through a rite of passage ourselves. So it was a semester long, so I don't know, five months. And one of the things they had us do, or many of the things was, we had to research nine months, what was going on nine months before our birth and nine months after our birth. And we had to look up the meanings of our name. And we had to ask our parents this question and that, a lot of different things we had to do. And I think that was, that was in the back of my mind while I was creating this for you. That if you, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna be putting you through lots of intentional rites of passages and these kind of things. Well, there's going to become a time where you're going to be doing those things out here and you're going to go on your own personal development, spiritual journeys. And so this can be, hopefully, a little insight for you into that. There's going to be things you're going to look back on and wonder, why was my dad so obsessed with asking this question of everybody? It's not helpful, Dad. You should have asked this question. And so that already give you insight into the fact that your mom and your dad and all of the people who care for you we all have our own perspective and biases and ways of looking at the world and so one of the advices or things that my dad always told me throughout my life we would always say be your own man Thomas and so my invitation for you would be to be your own person which is something that's both easy and challenging and so right now as you're being born you're gonna be excellent at being your own person you're gonna you're gonna whatever you want you're gonna ask for you're gonna and you're gonna believe you can get it and so if ever you find yourself in someone's shadow or you find that you have been following the beat of someone else's drum or you're following the beat of your own drum right now and it's it's a challenge, you're receiving pushback for it, I just want you to remember that you're not here yet, but already in Adora's belly, I can tell you that you are definitely being your own person. Yep. That when the, uh, every single time this happens, not once, every single time when the nurses or the doctor comes to put the, the, the monitor on you, you go to the other side, you're like, nah, no monitor for me. When they're like, wake up, you go to sleep. So you, you're doing your own thing right now. And I have a feeling tomorrow when you come on out, you're going to do your own thing. So that that ability to be yourself, you had that's one of the first things that you, have, that you had in terms of moving just beyond your physical things like your heart and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's my invitation for you to be your own person and to, to talk it out, to try to always give mom and I the chance to talk it out even if you need to go for a walk or you need to go to Edaguku for a, a month absolutely but past a month I'm probably going to track you down show up via helicopter like I'm here let's talk about this <laughs> so that's that's my, my hope that no matter what happens between any of us because things will happen yeah. that we always Talk, talk it through. Let's see, anything else that I've asked people? I think what you can turn to me for is going to be different as you get older. I think what you can turn to me for now is fun. I feel like I'm going to be a lot of the fun. <laughs> Not to say that I won't do the your diaper changing and all those logistical and some discipline and this yeah discipline too so i have this theory leadership is a bridge management is a bridge i'm sure parenthood is going to be a bridge we're going to have two polarized opposite things what discipline and freedom 
uh, fun and seriousness. And each circumstance is going to call for a different part on that bridge that I will be. So it's always helpful to have a structure from which to improvise within. I, I feel like I just want to keep talking it out, but it feels so, oh, this is the final, this is the last thing we're going to say before I conclude these interviews and then baby's here. Oh, I'm getting a little teary-eyed. <laughs> I think I'm stopping. <laughs> I'm looking forward to, I, I have had a lot of fun recording these 15 minute, ours is the longest one, everything else was 15 minute interviews on a particular topic. So, and around you, baby. So I'm looking forward to interviewing people once you're born and you're in their arms or different things like that. So I'm curious about, about that next chapter. So you're gonna learn maybe that a lot of things come back to tomrell.com, so. <laughs> It's also an adorawandy.com, but... Yeah, dot net. Yeah, adora.net. But, yeah. <laughs> Anything else, my love? That's everything. All right. We are so excited to meet you. What a absolute, absolute honor and privilege it is to get to be your parents. What a, what a true blessing. And... I've, I've always known, Adora asked very early, earlier ago, you know, my journey of wanting to be a parent. And you'll, you'll hear our, our love story many times. But when we were going through that 24 to 36 hour period of, are we going to move forward together or not? The thing that I kept thinking all along, whenever Adora and I would talk about babies, is whoever gets to have Adora as a mom automatically hit, hit the jackpot and you know you, I want I've always known once I have a kid I want them to have as many advantages as they can have and having a good mom is probably one of the best advantages you can get in the game so I knew that Slauson why told me to get off at Slauson so I knew that I knew that having a door as the mom would be the best and so so excited to talk with you and for you get to get to look up and see Adora smiling down at you. That's that's what I'm so excited for you to, to get. Alright. Love you, baby. Love you. And I love you, my love. Love you. Peace and blessings. See you soon. Inshallah. I hope you enjoyed the conversations that I'm sharing with you this week. And I hope you return again next week to continue this series, Gifts for You, and continue to receive the insights, the messages, and if I can use the word again, the gifts that each conversation is ready to share with you. My friends, I thank you for being here with us this week, and I look forward to you returning again next week for the next edition of Gifts for You. As always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. See you next week. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomrell.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>